Right, well, I'm with Michael Brunt, who's the general manager at Times Newspapers, and we're talking about paywalls, and in particular, paywall strategies during a global news agenda and a global crisis. So welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. So um, obviously, we've had one of the biggest uh, sort of news events of our lifetimes. Um, some newspapers who had been behind paywalls, they, they took that as an opportunity maybe to market themselves. They put some content in front of the paywall. Um, some more than others, you made a decision that you wouldn't do that. So just tell us, you know, the rationale for that. Sure. I mean, every publication is going to be different and every publication around the world is operating in a different market. Um, and every publication also will have a different environment that they're working in in advance of one of, one of these surges in the news agenda. Um, so what we decided to do um, was to remove the sale offers that were available prior to the lockdown, um, tighten our paywall and ask people to pay upfront for a subscription um, with no trial and uh, with no introductory offer. Um, what I did do, because um, normally our subscription prices are £26 a month, um, so you'd have to pay £26 straight up for your first month, right at the beginning of that month, um, I introduced a lower priced digital subscription at £15 a month for access to one smartphone and also our coronavirus newsletter. So quite a different strategy from other publications, but um, it's not, you know, I'm not here to judge those necessarily. It was more um, the mechanics of, uh, of how that would benefit the times and in relation to what we had in the market prior to the lockdown as well. Okay, so it wasn't, it wasn't just a case of not putting free content out there, but you actually almost became a little bit more aggressive in your kind of paywall, if you like. Yes. Um, I mean, anyone who's running a newspaper is going to be thinking about how do I capitalise on a surge in interest in the news and a surge coming from a particular news agenda. And when you put your stuff out in front of a paywall, it is there to lure people in as a marketing ploy um, it's not necessary. It's not necessarily just for the for the good of the nation in that respect. Um, and of course, in the UK, we have very good quality um, sources for breaking news, such as the BBC. But my view was that as a, a publication that provides, you know, high quality analysis and uh, sort of interrogates the news and provides a, a, a kind of in, you know what we believe the implications would be and a range of opinions on that. That that's journalism that's worth paying for. Um, and that people would get their free sources of news and they would also want to pay for more in-depth analysis as well. So I, I, um, you know, I counted on that demand being there and it was certainly the right thing for us to do. OK, and you were only two months into the job when the lockdown began as well. So, I mean, obviously thrown in at the deep end, I guess. But did you already, you know, had you already thought these things through about, uh, you know, possibilities of news bumps or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. So I, I just... Um, I moved uh, um, one week I was, was publisher and CEO of The Economist and then the next week I was general manager of The Times. Um, and so I've got a lot of experience of uh, navigating a circulation business when there are bumps in the news agenda, particularly for The, uh, for the Economist. It was a uh, combination of Trump, everything, everything from his uh, nomination and through to his inauguration and then the early years of his presidency and also Brexit. Um, and so I've seen what can happen and I've tested lots of different ways of reacting to news agenda uh, surges as well. So um, I kind of was looking out for the opportunity. You, you, when, a, when a news agenda, when there is a surge in demand, you can pick that up really quickly if you're monitoring your traffic and you're monitoring what people are reading. And then you can, you can, use that as a shift in the market to try something different or, or to break a previous um, continuum if you want to change your strategy. So a big shift like that is a good time to do it. Um, and, and the shift that I wanted to put in place, having been in the job for a couple of months, was a move away from um, an sort of almost, all, always on discount offers, whether it was three months for three pounds or eight weeks for eight pounds, and then we go back to three months, three pounds, that sort of thing good at driving consideration, good at driving trial, but the churn rate I felt was too high. Um, and certainly when, you know, when I was interviewing for the role, that was also by, you know, the senior editor and an executive at News UK said to me, you know, churn is the thing that we're most worried about. 
And of course, the, the first step in improving churn is making sure you're recruiting the type of subscriber who's most likely to continue renewing. Um, and if your marketing engine is pointing towards and optimized by the number of trialists you bring on board, um, then that might be contributing to the higher churn rate. So what I wanted to do was um, break the, the, the kind of cycle of, uh, of trial offers that were out to market and use the news agenda and the surge in demand to introduce a, an upfront payment um, to which I can then test other things as a control. So the, the default option is you have to pay up front. And now I've got that. I've got a basis of analysis and, and enough numbers and statistically valid numbers that enable me to test other things, which I've already started doing now that we see we're outside of that um, surge. Okay. And you introduced the lower price tier, didn't you? The, the £15 where you can only view on a smartphone and you get the Chrome yes. newsletter. So you've got the £26 is the main subscription. Yeah. Um, so just run us through the £15 one. You know, how did that work and did you test it, for example? Yeah, so we, um, well, we had three test cells running. The, the previous offer, um, which, so right just the, the day before the lockdown, we were running a sale offer of eight weeks for eight pounds, and then you moved on to the 26 pounds a month. Um, so I kept 10% of the file of your prospects, 10% of store visitors would see that. Um, and then of the rest, I split it 45%, so 26 pound only. And 45% saw the option of £26 or £15. And what we found really quickly is that um, if you gave people that choice, the, uh, the combined response was much greater. So it, 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 was, it was good to give people choice. Um, so I've continued with that um, lower price tier as well. So most, most people, over 75%, took the £26. Um, but we were able to just pick up some people who, for whom, you know, perhaps they don't want to quite make a twenty-six pound commitment, um, and they, and they would be happy with um, with a with, with just one smartphone and the coronavirus newsletter. Okay, and what about the the general results then? I mean, what's happened to your total subscriber base? Maybe your conversion rates or your churn rates? Yeah. So I mean, the first thing I did was, <coughs> excuse me, take a look at, um, obviously. Um, the, the weeks, uh, uh, you know, week 36, I think, for our financial year, when the lockdown started, and then up until now, looked at the orders that we've uh, that we have we received in that period, and compared it to the same weeks last year, um, and there was a 60% uplift, which looks remarkable because that was a that would that's comparing a sale with a full price, um, but we had actually already, you know, during the team had already been optimizing well. Um, and results were already up year on year. So if you strip out the, the fact that we generally were doing a better job um, before the lockdown, um, the uplift was about 20%. Um, so, but, but I'm really happy about that because the, that's comparing, that's 20% more people subscribing, um, paying full price up front versus the number of people who you know previously would only have been able to come on an eight weeks for eight pounds type of offer. So I'm really happy with the results. And I'm also really pleased with the number of people who are staying beyond their first month, um, which um, understandably because they've already had to make the commitment to pay full price upfront. Um, the, the number of people who go on to their second months is, is you know, best part of 95%. So I'm really, really pleased with that because we wouldn't normally see that um, sort of decay. Um, we normally expect maybe only 80% to to survive their first month if you're offering a trial. Um, so it, it is, uh, yeah, it's definitely been a good thing and, 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 and is already helping our churn rates. And when we've mapped out um, based on the early decay rates, um, we have a model um, which our data scientists have built, which is remarkable um, in that they can predict someone's long-term tenure based on the first day's engagement so so they look at what you've been uh, um um what you've been um you know what interactions you have displayed within that very first day the first week is almost spot on if we could take a week's worth of data but they can even do a predictive model based on the first day um and of course we're in a we're in a period of high d news demand um and so perhaps the current performance may not reflect the entirely reflect the future but um, it looks incredibly promising. And, and if I look at the short term, um, 
you know, the, the moving to full price straight up has given us a big boost in revenues in the short term because I've got the money straight up uh, and with a higher volume of people as well. Um, and then if you model out based on how highly engaged these people are, it's very likely that their tenure means will make a lot more money across the years, the next full year, year two and year three. So, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty pleased with the results. Okay, so when this is, you know, when coronavirus finally passes, do you think that the subscription base level will be notably higher as a result of it and it will stay higher because, you know, people won't just drift off once the world crisis ends? Yeah, I mean, we... We um, so far we we are seeing that the people who've been who who joined us and subscribe because they want to know what the Times thinks about coronavirus are certainly staying, but we are still in the middle of the pandemic and you know there is there is definitely um, news fatigue out there as well and so we've we've been very carefully monitoring how much people read about coronavirus and how much people want to read about other stuff as well because life goes on else outside of coronavirus so. Um, you, you won't necessarily notice it, but the content in our newspaper shifted as well as we've, we've, we've been monitoring what do people want. Um, and, you know, people want to be entertained particularly and to, to sort of give other bits of content as well. And to show that life you know, continues, you know, after this, life goes on. Um, so I do, I do think that we will, we will definitely, um, we'll definitely see a dip in the number of people that we recruit week by week as, uh, over the next few weeks, because we, we will have brought forward people's decision to subscribe. And in almost every study that, you, that anyone looks at, uh, uh, you know, there's been some really good sort of international studies done on the impact of news, news uh, spikes on subscription businesses. You expect there to be a dip after the news agenda and once news, um, you know, once news fatigue around that subject starts to creep in. I mean, that is at that point that you change your offer again and put something new and different and perhaps a little bit more generous in the marketplace. And that's what I've done. Um, so we've we've uh, we've now the, 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 the main offer that most people will see is that they can either have a, a, a month free or a week free, depending on which test cell you're in. Um, and then you subscribe. Um, and I think that's the right thing to do to counter out that dip that you would get after the news fatigue on that subject starts to kick in. Um, and what about the £15 one smartphone only offer? Will that hang around once coronavirus passes? Um, at the moment, I'm keeping it because the if you give people that choice, it, it uplifts the overall response rate. Um, and I'm happy with the um, with the, the, the kind of retention rates of the £15 people. Um, and also, I've always got the opportunity to upgrade them because I restricted quite a lot of stuff, you know, um, you, you know, you can't, you can't access your subscription on multiple devices and people might want to be able to look at it on an iPad, on another phone or certainly on their desktop. Um, and we've also got lots of newsletters, um, which are of great value, a lot of people really enjoy, um, but they're not accessing. So it's given me an opportunity to upgrade them, um, but also they might be happy with that. So I'm, I'm keeping it in for now um, because I'm happy with the stick rates and I'm happy with the, overall lift in response that you get by providing choice okay and i know this has been a success and obviously you've got in front of more people and it's been a big subscription uh, boost but i mean you could say that you had a once in a lifetime opportunity to go out with your brand and market it to people who would probably you know never read the times and, and especially i'm thinking like young people who maybe don't necessarily buy sort of they don't spend 15 or 26 pounds on any kind of digital product um, you could have pushed in front of them and there's data out there, which as we all know is gold dust. You could have got people to sign up for sort of peak deals. I mean, do you, do you look at it as you kind of like, you chose subscriptions over marketing? Um, I think if you didn't have other things going on and only did this in isolation, that would be a really, really valid point. Um, but one of the things that we've got going at the same time is, uh, is our presence on Apple News and Apple News Plus, which is really driving um, a broader audience um, to consider us and read our stuff than um, than, than we had traditionally. So um, that that was running and running really well. Um, we're really pleased with the uplift in um, in traffic and in, in in views of our content that we're getting through that. So that's that was already there. Um, and then waiting in the wings, um, we're launching an, uh, a national radio station on Monday, um, Times Radio. 
um, which I th we think is the first time a national newspaper has launched a national radio station. Um, and the, the main purpose for me, um, as well as entertaining our readers who love the Times already, is to give our brand some personality and some give people proximity to our own journalists. So whilst it's not going to be all Times journalists, we've got a fantastic lineup of uh, presenters um, and we've, we've managed to persuade some amazing people from the BBC to join us and we're absolutely delighted um, that, that that's going to be the, the way that I've got waiting in the wings to expand the reach of my brand. So it's, it's uh, to me, it's, it's it, you know, this decision, I have to say, was already made before I joined. So I cannot take credit for the, for the idea of launching Times Radio, but it fits in so nicely with exactly what you just suggested. How do you, as a newspaper, expand your reach to a broader audience and get in front of people who they might not consider you? Um, and to me, it's like the, the ultimate ongoing, everyday, um, incredible uh, brand campaign um, and so, yeah, so that, that's what I had waiting in the wings. So I think if you put it in context of knowing I was about to launch Times Radio and knowing that we're getting that reach and breadth beyond our core audience on Apple News Plus, I think that's probably in that context, it was the right thing to do. But I do agree with you, you know, many of my colleagues around the world have taken a very different view because they saw the, this news hike as a, as a way of reaching broader audiences. And I think that, you know, I, I don't discredit that at all. I think it's a very wise thing to do as well. The reason I didn't do it is because I've got all these other things that I'm balancing. Mm. So is the, is the, the radio station free to air? Yep, yeah. it's, uh, it's free um, on DAB and on, uh, on the internet. And uh, we, there are no commercial breaks, but there are sponsorship opportunities for clients as well. So that, I think it's the first, it's all talk. Um, so I think it's the first kind of commercial talk radio that has got no ads in it. Okay, and on the um, the sort of the paywall and subscription model generally, um, will you or would you ever consider modularising the Times in some way? Because the Telegraph, for example, do these puzzles for five pounds a month, I believe. Yeah, definitely. And the New York Times have done a you know have done some really good tests on that as well. Yes, I think um, modularising newspaper is a is something I'm very keen to look at. Um, it it pre presents quite a lot of opportunities. It's um, it gives you real, a real uh, a new lens for your marketing. So if it's around a particular topic, um, then you can use that particular passion of a, of a prospective subscriber to bring them in, um, you know, and market to them around that subject. But I I would want it to be uh, something of an on ramp product. So. So, uh, you know, I, I would have a view that would be happy for some of the subscribers to a modular piece of content to, to only subscribe to that. But I would always want to show people what you're not getting as well um, and, and use it as a means of migrating them to the full subscription products. And certainly that's something that I'd like to do. Um, and then from a, a sort of advertising perspective, um, it also gives you a new route to market with clients to say, you know, do you want to sponsor this modular component that might have a really close fit? You know, imagine if it was driving or imagine if it was style or fashion, um, that that sort of thing would be of great value. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely think it's a very wise thing to do as long as you create something that is, is an on ramp to your main subscription product and, and a new way of tapping into people's passions and, and a new way of reaching advertising revenues and, and, and targeting for your marketing as well. So yeah, I definitely think it's a good idea. Okay. And uh, newspapers in the UK, I mean, you have had an amazing half a decade, really. I mean, we've had the Scottish referendum, three general elections, the EU referendum, and now coronavirus, which of course, you know, we didn't want that one. But um, uh, do you think we've kind of almost reached the high watermark for interest in news i mean can it get any better do you kind of worry that maybe you know unless there's some other crisis that we haven't seen yet we've kind of like topped out in terms of news interest and how much we can consume uh i mean so who was it? so somebody said you know that, that we were witnessing the end of history in the 90s um and you know we thought this is it now we've reached our status quo but the world never ceases to uh, surprise us and I, I think 
you know, if we, 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 as we approach the elections in America, who knows what the president's going to do and what he's going to say. And what, you know, I think um, he's been certainly extremely helpful to publications in, uh, in providing content um, and analysis. Um, so I don't, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, the world is, is in constant change. The, you know, the world of work is changing constantly. There's, a, you know, the forces of digitization and globalization and, you know, you're changing society massively. So I, I, I can't see an end to news. Um, and I think, you know, that, that, that surge in demand for analysis is, is certainly not going away. And it, it has been something of a flight quality. So I've been lucky enough to work in publications that are, you know, trusted and have high quality journalism and we they've definitely benefited the economists benefited and the times is benefiting from from a flight um to quality but but it's who you trust in a time that's uncertain um and and that's where you turn to um so i i don't see that that's going to come to an end but what, what i also don't see coming to an end is the relentless and structural change in the migration from print to digital advertising and that that digital advertising revenue is not going to the publishers it's going to the big tech platforms and so i think um you know you we've, we've had a you know a business that's purely based on advertising revenues is a, is a really tough business to work for and if you've got a, a growing and substantial subscription business then um which the times has thankfully um then i think you feel a much more secure place um and i just don't think your um source of news is ever going to run out <laughs> okay, no, you're probably right. So uh, anyway, well, con congratulations on your first uh, four months or five months at the Times and um, wish you well with the next few, few years. So thank you, Michael, for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you very much.